Well, hey, Cookster here, and welcome to another video. So, right from the very start, let me address my somewhat clickbaity title. Yes, I did soak an entire 1931 Model A body, just not at one time. So, if you don't know, the 20s cars, the early 30s cars, up to I'm not sure, maybe the 35s and 6s, not sure. Those cars had a lot of wood in them, providing structure. Basically, the outer panels, the doors, I'm not the doors, but the the quarter panels, the the cow, all that stuff, was was mounted onto a wood structure. The sheet metal panels are all screwed or riveted or, or tacked or nailed, I think, even to that structure. So those car bodies are very easy to take apart, especially nowadays, a hundred years later, when the the wood's all rotted away. Uh, the cars just come apart, you know, almost with no effort. That's not true, but. Now I'm lucky on mine, I have a 31 Model A four door slant window sedan. That's important. That entire name is important because that's one of, that may be, I guess it probably is Ford's first car uh, that had a basically an all steel body. There is wood in the car, but the wood's only there to provide like tacking strips for the interior and things like that. The body itself the B pillars, the roof, the roof structure, the floors, all that stuff is made of steel. There's no wood structure holding that body together. But the bodies are still relatively easy, and I'm using air quotes here, the bodies are relatively easy to take apart. They're still riveted, uh, uh, and so there are some wells, of course, on, on these bodies. So what I was able to do is soak the individual panels you know, separately. So my model, my electrolysis tank you're about to see is four by eight. You know, four, four feet by eight feet. It's a foot deep. It's big enough to get every individual panel in there by itself. So so far, I've soaked both quarter panels. I'll show you in a moment. I've soaked both quarter panels. The rear panel, which you can't see, is back here. The front H frame, I call it, which supports the windshield and the upper roof. So I have soaked the entire body, just not the doors and the cowl and the fender or the uh, firewall or fenders or doors yet. So here's the passenger side quarter panel. Of course, it's upside down. I have already sandblasted inside the panel. I'm not going to show you that now because it's too much trouble to use this to move this panel. But you can see around the edges I've sandblasted. The inside has already been sandblasted. There's the rear panel. Again, I have I didn't sandblast the outside. The inner side's been sandblasted, but there's the rear panel. I did soak the two. I lied earlier. I did soak the two uh, cowl panel sides. They're starting. They're surface rusting, but they've been sand, soaked and sandblasted. There's the front H frame. I call it. There's one of the. There's a crossbar. That. This is where your windshield sits right here. This is the cowl area, firewall area down here. There's the floor pan. Now the floor pan, I've only sandblasted the two sides because I'm cutting the center section out and going to remake all this. Driver side quarter panel. Again, I only sandblasted. I sandblasted the inside. You can see some of the inner structure and the sandblasting I've done down here. I still have to do the doors. I got four doors to do. It's a four door car. The fenders. Uh, the firewall, maybe the gas tank. So I still have pieces to do, but the biggest parts, which were the quarters and the the floor and the rear panel, those are all done. So there is a real quick overview of my panels and what I've done so far. Now we'll get into the video and we'll show you what I did. All right, here's my large scale electrolysis tank. It's a basically a four by eight sheet of plywood size. There's not a full sheet of 4x8 on the bottom, but that's basically the size of what I built it as. Now I could have built it bigger. Um, the floor pan for the Model A is here in here, and it just barely slides down in there. So I should have built it probably 50 inches wide, but at the time I built it, I was going to build it with a full 4x8 sheet of plywood on the bottom. And I got to thinking, that's not really necessary. All I need is, is some outriggers. To space it apart which is what I wound up doing it's actually saved me 
a half a sheet or so of plywood. Um, uh, use three quarters. So that stuff's expensive, as you guys probably probably know. If I, if I had built it again, I'd probably build it 50 inches wide. Uh, and it's of course eight feet long, which is actually a little longer than it needs to be, but it gives me some extra room. Four by eight, and it's upside down. So this is the bottom you see here. So I got four sides. It's a foot deep this way. I, X, I put an X or a gusset in each corner so it wouldn't rack, so it would stay square. And then these three bars across the middle so the sides won't blow out. There's going to be a lot of water in here, but I calculate. 300 gallons I don't remember I don't remember the math um, but anyway a lot of water in there a lot of weight a lot of pressure on the sides so once I get this thing flipped over and I'm gonna put it outside um, I don't have a spot in my garage to leave it for weeks at a time because I've got so many panels I want to do I got the floor pan the two sides the back the H frame. I got a lot of panels to do. So uh, anyway, I'll turn it over. Obviously, that'll be the bottom. I will need to shim the bottom some, make sure it's good and level, because the water will just blow the weight of that right out. Or the weight of the water will just blow those bottoms right out if my ground's not perfectly level, which is not. And I'm going to line it with a heavy duty uh, 30 mil tarp. I think it's 30 mil. So three quarter plywood, these are one befores, obviously. I bought some uh, graphite rods that were 12 inches long to use for the vertical uh, array or vertical rods, sacrificial rods. So there's also four six foot long pieces of rebar in here. That's, that's doing the most of the work. So for electrolysis to work the best, you need to have line of sight of your piece you're working on and the, and the anode, the cathode, whatever they are, the bars, the rebar. So the only way to really make this work was to put rebar in here this way, laying in, in plane with the panel also running this way. And that's, that's doing most of the work. Uh, the little graphite rods are probably helping some. So uh, the tank's running. You can see the, the scale and the sludge starting to uh, collect on top of the rods. The longer this thing runs, you'll start to see slag and crap forming. But uh, that's, oh, and the welder, I already got, I'll show you, I'll show you the welder in a minute. It's a little 12, oh not 12 volt, it's a little uh, DC welder, plugs into the wall, runs off of 120, 110 right there. So the power supply I'm using for the uh, large electrolysis tank is not a power supply. Well, it is a power supply, it's just not a condi conditional, it's not a conventional power supply, it's a little small DC welder, arc welder. So it's made by Sender. S-I-M-D-E-R, and the model number is somewhere, the ARC, the ARC 200. That's an actually, it's actually a little DC ARC welder. Um, I read quite a bit online about people building large scale tanks, and pr pretty much every one of them used a, a DC ARC welder. So I searched around and kind of found one in my price range, it's actually pretty cheap. I think I paid like $60 for it. And the current is adjustable. Some of them don't have current adjustable. Some of them have like voltage and stuff, which is probably the same thing, but I was just looking at one that specifically said current adjust, which this one has. 20 to 80 amps, I think, or 60 amps. Anyway, I've got it on the lowest setting. I run it on the lowest setting, which is 20 amps. Now, this does not have a built-in current meter. If you watch my other electrolysis video, my bench top power supply, you know, it has a current meter that shows you the current. I just turned this one down to 20 and then took a meter. So unloaded, you electronics folks, you know what unloaded means. So open, open circuit, no, not really open circuit, yeah, open circuit. It's sitting there with no load, it's putting out about 70 volts DC, but that's no load. There's no current flow flowing, no voltage flowing, just, just two, the two probes in air. Basically, no, no load. It's about 70 volts. When I load it down in my tank and set my, my current saying to 20 amps, it's putting about 5.5 to 6 volts DC, which makes perfect sense. It's going to pull that 70 volts down way, 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 way down to get that 20 amps or so. 
Now I never bought an actual current meter or put a current meter in it to see if it's actually putting out 20 amps. At some point I'll either get a clamp meter, I used to have a clamp meter and I lost it, or I'll put a panel meter in here. I'll probably just buy another clamp meter to see if it actually is putting out 20 amps. But that's not so much a concern to me. This thing is ran now. Uh, it's probably got a, well, let's see. No, I started it with this tank here. Oh, this floor pan. So it's probably got 60 hours of runtime on it so far. Conti no, that's, not, that's not 60 hours continuous. That's six days, 10 to 12 hours a day. It never gets hot. It never overheats. It does have a fan that's inside of it that runs. And so far, knock on wood, knock on something, it's ran just fine. It never overheated or anything. So I'm going to use this thing until the day it, it, it maybe, if it, if it ever dies on me. Hopefully it won't. There's uh, six different copper lines in the in the array, in the array bars. There's, there's two, the two wooden bars you see have graphite graphite rods in them, and then there's four lines of rebar, four sticks of rebar. So they all come together, the six lines. So I, I form loops in the in the. I used a, I used 12 gauge, 12 gauge copper solid copper wire, Romex wire, just stripped it out of the out of the jacket. So I made loops in the end of the 12 gauge that I can run a bolt to and bolt them all together. So instead of trying to use wire nuts or some other method at the time, I just used a bolt and squeezed them all up. Work, works really good. And here's the other side of the connection. I just bent up a welding rod, put a put a, a welded a washer to the end of it, got a couple of bolt of bolts and some washers and just bolted through a hole in, in the pan. And that's how I hook it up to my to my array array with this rod uh yeah you know what you know what i mean and i made hangers in my wooden brackets there's four hangers i just bent basically a j hook it's got a hook in the end and the top's been over so i adjust my height i hang the rebar in there and bend the rod over so it can't go through any further so here's the bar i'm talking about so i made up these j hooks that hold to hold my rebar at the top at the height I want them to uh, to hang and then th these are graphite rods I bought these these are easier to use than uh, than regular rebar they don't they don't corrode and, and like your rebar does but they are more expensive and they only they're only a foot long so uh, these will corrode away because over time they are getting smaller I can see with the diameter of them they they give off they they give off uh, they shed themselves just like the rebar does so they won't last forever so I don't know if I'll ever use rebar again or not. I mean uh, the graphite again it's it's good for some things so it is a lot easier to use this floor pan has been in there about 40 hours for between both sides actually it may have been maybe longer than that. Um, I've lost track of days actually. I had it in there I think three days on, on one side and then flipped it. And I'm pretty sure today is the third day on the other side. So that's, that's about 60 hours of, of soak time. 50 to 60 so it's, it's soaked a long time. I hadn't intended to soak it that long but I had to get my other sides ready and stuff and it took me that long so I figured might as well keep soaking until I get ready. So what I'm about to do is break it down and take the, take the pan out. So I'm a one man show here, so it's kind of bulky and clumsy to get it out of that tank by myself. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take it out and let you watch. So my butt's probably gonna be back back in my butt for the camera, but you'll get the idea. So.
then I can pull the bar out. So again, it's, it's just a one by four with half inch holes drilled with the graphite through it. I used hose clamps to clamp the wire to the to the to the graphite, and then left a long tail on it that I hook into that bolt I just showed you right there. Pretty simple actually. These are just four six foot pieces of regular half inch rebar. I welded nuts to the top and then I bolt, uh, put my copper wire on there and made a loop and bolted them through there. Very simple. You do have to clean those bars every so often. I was cleaning them every night after like eight or ten hours. Uh, but this tank here is not. I guess it's because it's bigger and the rods are brand new. They don't crust up as bad and as fast as like in my small tank, like in the 55 gallon drum, or even when I was using a 20 gallon pail. So I'm gonna let these run a couple days, a couple, couple runs, which is 20 or so hours. Cause it's kind of hard, that, that tank's kind of aggravating to take it apart and put it back together. It's not hard, it's just tedious. Uh, and then I let them, I take them out overnight one night and let them dry overnight, which they'll dry in 10 minutes with a, with a blow up air hose in the, in the summertime. We'll let them dry and then take a grinder and just knock them off again and they're ready to go. A cheap grinder, I mean, not cheap, but a grinder with a wore out disc just to knock the, the top layer of rust off and put them back in and go again. This isn't the easiest thing to do. Like I said, it's, it's big and bulky and I'm by myself, so I do, I do it the best way I can. So the way I'm doing it, I, I put a half a concrete block back here at the back. I raise it up, get it about halfway out of the water, then raise the nose up. And the other side was easier because it doesn't have those two trays there full of water. Now it's full of water, makes it a lot heavier. So I have to kind of tip it over and get the water out. The other side will just pull right up. Uh, but I'll, you'll see, I'll get it out in a minute. Should be smart and put a boot on and stick my foot in here for leverage, but I don't want to do it. So we're going to do it like this and hope I don't pull a pull a muscle. This ain't light, by the way, so but it works. And you got to get it out of here, which is a trick in itself. All right, here we go. Now that I got it down where I can walk it, it's not so bad. So let me get let me get cleaned up. As you can see, uh, you may yell at me about wearing gloves. That's just that soap baking baking soda solution. 
probably should be wearing gloves, but I'm not. A couple more things I did that might be worth noting. I didn't want the bottom of the tank or the pan either side when I had it in this side of the top and this side of the top. I didn't want the pan sitting directly on my tarp for a couple of reasons. Number one, if I sat directly on the bottom, then there'd be a whole area here that wasn't covered, that wouldn't, you know, basically wouldn't be in the water correctly. Plus, this bracket here would have stuck down and pinched my tarp. And then, there, you know, I could have punched holes in that tarp. That's only a, that's only a 20 mil tarp. It's a heavy duty, but it's not a big super duty duty, heavy duty, heavy, heavy, heavy duty tarp. I think it's 20 mil um so it, it would you punch a hole in it pretty quick with a with a sharp object so i put i screwed these uh two before blocks on the bottom so this is how it was sitting in the tank so these are these blocks are actually sitting on the bottom and then of course when i, when I did this side i moved them over here and it sat this way and this piece never you know hit the bottom of my tarp so uh i think that's all i wanted to talk about so there there's the pan. That's the bottom of the pan, the roadside. Um, if you don't know about electrolysis, and it's still wet, I didn't blow all the moisture off of it yet. When it turns this black color, basically all the rust converting converts to this black black compound. I forget what it's called, but it's basically it's a black powderish stuff that you sandblast right off. Of course, you can still see a little bit of the red oxide primer left. But most of the paint, when you do electrolysis, most of the paint, especially on areas that, that are kind of rusty or, or kind of marginally adhesion, the paint will just pop right off, blow off, blow right off either with water or an air hose. Uh, this side, that's that's rusty water. Uh, the panel is not rusted anymore. <laughs> This is just a light sandblasting. You, um, you watched me do it. I'm not sure how much of it I cut out or fast forwarded, but this this was not hard to do. It's just a light going over. In case you're not aware, or let me say it again, I am not sandblasting the rust off. The rust is gone. The electrolysis has converted all the rust into this, this black coating right here. That's what the rust converts into. And, and there's this is dirt and crud. That's, that's, that, that may be rusty crud, but it's not embedded in the metal anymore. The metal is clean. See, just a little brush with a sandblaster right there, clean those nuts up. Um, but the sand, the rust is gone. I'm sandblasting that black coating off. Very quick, very easy. Any of you that's ever sandblasted the actual rust before knows how long it takes, how hard it is to do, how much time you have to sit in one spot to sand. And I'm using that siphon blaster, which I like using that thing. I got a pressure pot. 
that thing's big and bulky and you have to use two hands on the nozzle and it's a pain in the butt and blah blah I like using that siphon, siphon feed it's a little slow but uh I'm not getting paid to do this this is this is not a job or an hourly job or anything so I just I like using my little siphon feed on stuff like this uh, but I only blend I only blend sass to golly I only sandblasted the sides the bottom of the sub rails on each side because that's those are the only parts I'm going to be using on this car the center section I'm going to cut out um, and I'm going to try and save it so don't don't be crying it's riveted on so I'm going to try and drill all the rivets out and pull it out and save it because that floor pan is in excellent shape I showed you the back half I did I did plasma cut the back side off and it's right there it's in horrible shape now I might could have kept it on there for somebody to just repair the 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 edges of it but uh you know I could even put that in, in electrolysis for somebody if I wanted to and sell it along with the pan and you, but that's that piece is in pretty rough shape around the edges but anyhow what I'm going to do is I'm going to make all my modifications and, and changes to the side uh, sub rails and make a new floor pan in the middle because I'm, I'm making a new frame and all that stuff and this is not going to fit the time I get done. But uh, so I said I wanted to get the, the, the rails sandblasted. The first actual rust repair I'm going to be doing on these sub rails is replacing this front area here. This this section of the sub rail is fine. A few little rust holes I can, which I can weld up, no problem. But this section here is, is is shot. It's rusted, you know, completely rusted through right here. It's gone. I didn't grind this away. It was gone. It was rusted away. So I got to make a new section from you know from somewhere here forward. Still planning on how I want to do that, but uh, that's that's for another video. But anyway, that's sandblasting. That's that's. Uh, large-scale electrolysis and then sandblasting and how easy that was so that's the end of the video uh, here's my floor pan like I said with the, with the sub rail bottom sandblasted ready to go ready for repair and and uh, the modifications I'm gonna be doing in the future well, this was a real short little quick little video I'm not even sure exactly what I put in it because I'm, I'm I'm making this video out of a bunch of clips I put together and mishmash so It'll be a video of some type. Basically what I wanted to show was large scale electrolysis, how you can do that. Uh, use a DC welder, arc welder for your power supply. And then uh, how easy the sandblasting is on these large pieces. Very, very easy. Be sure to do all the YouTube stuff. Like, comment, subscribe. I'm Cookster, Cookster's Garage. Uh, spread it all around. Tell your buddies all that good stuff. And I'll catch you on the fifth side. Y'all come back now, you hear? Happy big ass electrolysis, y'all. Yeehaw!